So welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining our talk. We are really, really excited to be here at this incredible conference. And uh, yeah, what we're, what we're going to talk about today is uh, Akka cluster versus Kubernetes. So you know, versus in our world is uh, um, used often, maybe not always appropriately. So let's see where this talk goes. Um, uh, let's just start with a little introduction about ourselves. Uh, my name is Fabio Diritico. I come from Italy, but I'm based in the Netherlands. Uh, pretty much everywhere on the internet, I'm Tico Fab, and I work as a Scala and Akka consultant. So actually, how many of you guys are familiar with the, this reactive systems approach? And Akka. With Akka. Who uses Akka in production? OK, a few, a few. That's good. That's good. Um, I am very, very fond of these things, so much that I founded the Reactive Amsterdam Meetup. We are a community uh, getting to 2,000 members, so I'm really, really happy about that. And we discussed everything reactive. And I'm Adam. Is, does this mic work also? I think it does. Uh, hi, I'm a uh, Kubernetes consultant, on the other hand, so uh, you can see where this is going. Uh, Raise your hands, please, whoever works with Docker and Kubernetes here. All right. Oh. <laughs> Way to go. Um, so I, together with my colleagues from Container Solutions, uh, we help companies adopt Kubernetes. So I do a lot of work with companies uh, working to uh, turn monoliths into microservices and uh, run them in Docker and Kubernetes. And uh, a, about a year ago, I met, uh, met Fabio. Uh, we were working for the same client. And we started discussing building distributed systems. We were also both involved in the Amsterdam IT community. I was running a uh, different meetup. And we realized that the two communities, the reactive community and the Kubernetes or the cloud native community, are kind of solving the same problem of building reactive distributed systems. But we are approaching the same, this, this problem, this central problem, from such different angles that actually when you go to a conference of one or the other community, you hear very different things. On the, the, the reactive community is talking about non-blocking I.O., reactive programming, actor models, while the Kubernetes community coming from a more systems engineering operations background, we're talking about Docker containers and the resource allocation and microservices and service discovery and all these things. But both of these are trying to, to solve the same problem of building distributed systems the right way. And when we realized that, that we are so, like, in a way, incompatible in our knowledge, we sat down and we tried to, to figure this all out. So how to combine the two? Or is, the, is one approach actually better than the other? Kubernetes and cloud native is the, is the newer buzzword. And, uh, and it also has a larger mind share right now than, uh, than the, the reactive approach. So is it superseding it? Or, or is this just a different thing and maybe we should, uh, we should use them together? So this is what we explored over a long series of like, sessions with Fabio where we argued and discussed and uh, read some literature and basically distilled our ideas down into a few introductory topics and then answering these four questions. Basically, can Kubernetes make an application reactive in how the reactive community thinks about these problems? And if it can, then what value does Akka cluster provide on top of Kubernetes? Uh, is Akka uh, cluster suitable for building microservices? Because those are a newer concept than clustering Akka actors. And how can Akka cluster and Kubernetes work together? And we hope that this talk brings value to also those who are not working with either Akka or Kubernetes and just give an interesting perspective on distributed systems design and architecture. Fabio. Right. So let's quickly introduce these reactive system concepts and reactive system architectures. 
um, no presentation that talks about reactive systems can start without the reactive manifesto. Um, this was a manifesto published in 2013 by Jonas Bonner and other fine people that you see on screen. And the best wording about it, I've heard it from Jamie Allen during a presentation at um, React Sphere this uh, past spring, that says that we build elastic and resilient systems based on message-driven architectures in order to guarantee our users a responsive experience, where users, it's not only humans, but it could be another service. It's really user in a, in a generic sense. And then today we're gonna focus on elasticity and resiliency. So let's quickly glance over those two concepts. Uh, the key to elasticity is distribution <coughs> nowadays. Um, previously, we've all had this uh, approach of scaling up, scaling up things. So we have one machine, we need more capacity, we make it bigger. And we buy another bigger machine. Uh, but recently, this has been quite limited by the speed of light, actually. So if you see like CPU, increase, have CPU speed and clock speed haven't increased that much in the past decade. So the world has gone for scaling out, which means adding more machines next to each other and parallelizing work or distributing work in some way. So distribution becomes really key. And the key to distribution is location transparency. And it's a very simple concept um, to explain. Let's say Adam is in New York and he wants to send me an email. Well, location transparency is the concept that he doesn't need to know where I am. So it doesn't matter if I'm in Siberia or, or I'm in Australia. I guess I'd rather be in Australia. But I might also be in the same building where he is. All he needs to know is my email address. And he doesn't need to know where to address it because yeah, Google, in my case, does, for it, does it for him. Um, so location transparency, really, really, really important. And another thing is resilience. And so let me give one moment definition between, the distinction between fault tolerance and resilience where fault tolerance, we can word it as a component that is being hit but keeps going, maybe with a reduced functionality. And the best image I could find to, uh, to show this is this one. Let's see how many of you recognize it. Anybody? <laughs> Yay. Yeah, this is the end of the first Terminator movie. And this guy, you know, has been hit in any way possible but keeps crawling on with reduced functionality but still doing the job. Whereas resilience, it's this idea that upon failure, a component is able to jump back into a fresh state, uh, fully functional, clean. And you probably already see where this is going. That's our resilient guy. There you go. Jumping back, fresh as a daisy. So with these two concepts introduced, now let's quickly glance over ACA. What is ACA? ACA is basically what you can use in your everyday implementation. So from the reactive principles that we've seen before from the reactive manifesto, we can derive reactive design patterns and then some reactive building blocks. And ACA provides you exactly that. It's a, it's a toolkit that provides a lot of functionality out of the box for you to implement your, your resilient and distributed system. And notice that this is on the JVM, uh, really at an application level. Uh, there are similar concepts in other places, like Erlang has very similar concept right there, uh, but we'll, we'll be using ACA today. And what are the building blocks of ACA? They're actors. Um, one actor, you can see it as a basic unit of computation. Every actor can contain its own private state. So, for instance, an actor that represents Adam has its name Adam in it, and my actor has Fabio in it. And what's really crucial here is that this state can only be communicated via asynchronous messaging. So you would not be able to have a reference to your actor, for instance, and call a, a getter like that, get name. This is, in ACA, it's not possible. Instead, what can happen is that if Adam wants to know my name, he will send me a message saying, what's your name? And I will reply with another message saying Fabio. And so even when you run on a single JVM, you have already established an asynchronous boundary. 
So just like the example of the email around the world that we saw earlier, if we were to move this on two separate JVMs, the mechanics wouldn't change. And you have already built them when you program the actor in the first place. So location transparency with actor comes already built in. And then the other trait that we looked at, the resilience. How does ACA help us achieve resilience? Well, every actor, in fact, has a supervisor. You can see it, the supervisor as its parent, his dad kind of thing. Um, and when an actor experiences a failure, then this failure is not, in, is not handled inside the actor directly, but instead it's delegated to the supervisor. So the supervisor will know what to do when his children are failing. And it might, for instance, restart the actor. So let's see in practice how this works. So this is our friend from earlier. Let's say you decided you want to uh, code a Terminator out. Don't, by the way, it's a bad idea. But let's say you code it in, in Java with the classic object-oriented approach. And so we have a T800 instance. Well, in your code, you would do something like this. Try and walk. But something, something can go wrong. So you want to be able to catch failures. So uh, maybe we got an out of legs exception. Then at that point, you will likely modify some internal state, keep, keep track of what's going on, and provide an alternative functionality. So as soon as you, you know, catch more exceptions and more things can go wrong, your code becomes a little entangled, and state becomes difficult to track. How about the ACA way? Let's say that this guy is now an actor, is a 3,000 actor. Your code in the actor will be just this, walk. And then should a failure occur, you know that every actor has a supervisor. And let's say we have a very bad failure, a too many holes exception. Well, the, the supervisor will realize that and provide a fresh restart. There it is. Let's watch it again. So this is how ACA helps you out with resilience. Now, we've seen a few traits about ACA. So how about Kubernetes? Yeah. Let's take a look at Kubernetes. Basically, I don't really need to introduce it, I see. Everybody already heard about it, heard the buzz, and so on. But um, I will go over the important part, so that everybody is definitely in the know here. And also, I want to focus attention to certain important parts as opposed to ones that are not crucial for this talk. So Kubernetes is a container orchestration engine, which is goal is to run containerized applications over a set of infrastructure, in our case, VMs or uh, physical machines can do both. It only depends on the machine being a Linux server. And the goal is to create a kind of a cloud, symbolized by the clouds, to, uh, so that you, as the user of Kubernetes, don't have to care where your containers run. They will be scheduled by Kubernetes on a free piece of infrastructure and will be linked together by networking. That's why all the containers have IP addresses. And because uh, Docker was invented to uh, help microservice development easier, so it's basically a single process that is always running inside a Docker container, Kubernetes sees the world as a set of microservices or you can call them services also, it doesn't really matter how big they are, but uh, the more you have, the more use you are making out of Kubernetes. And uh, Kubernetes doesn't really see what's inside your container, so as opposed to Akka, it's not an application level thing, it comes more, as, more from the infrastructure side, but it provides all kinds of advanced capabilities to applications without having to modify it on the application layer that in the end gets you very far with building distributed applications. And why is Kubernetes uh, so big these days, or what's the proof that it's so big? 
is that at this moment, basically the, the biggest problem in, with Kubernetes is running it. That's the, that's the, the really hard part. Uh, and now all three major cloud providers have a managed Kubernetes service. You can see how big a deal that is, especially since Kubernetes came out of Google, but Google made a tremendous effort to make it a truly open source project. The governance of the project is under the Cloud Native Foundation, which is an offshoot of the Linux Foundation. So it's really an independent project, one on which people can count on to evolve based on the needs of the community and not on the needs of a, of a single vendor. So all these big cloud providers all sit on the board of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as well as other uh, representatives of other companies. And uh, the success of this approach can be seen in the fact that they have all adopted Kubernetes as a service they provide. So they don't look at it as some kind of competing thing. And also, we have a well newcomer to that to that arena. I bet something will happen there pretty soon with uh, the acquisition from yesterday. I don't know if you all heard. Uh, IBM just bought Red Hat, and I don't think they did it for the JBoss server. I think they did it for the uh, for uh, Red Hat's OpenShift platform, which is built on top of Kubernetes, which is an extended Kubernetes platform. And IBM is really keen to get into the. Uh, cloud business. So our question for today is really not how Kubernetes works, but uh, can Kubernetes uh, make my application reactive, just like Fabio said. So the, the people who made Akka actually also kind of invented these reactive principles. So there is a very nice match. Uh, the people who invented Kubernetes, I don't think they even really saw the manifesto ever, or maybe they did, I have no idea, but def it's definitely not something that is really discussed in the Kubernetes circles. Um, but let's take a look. So first of all, elasticity. Kuber as I said, Kubernetes sees the world as a set of containers that happen to run on certain virtual machines, which the whole goal is to make that unimportant. But the containers can be of different types that Kubernetes knows. Each container has a single purpose, it has some code in it, and I made the containers that happen to have the same code in them as different colors. So logically, these would be my UI service, my backend service, and my processing service. And all the containers have IP addresses, and all of them can talk to each other because that's the Kubernetes networking layer. Uh, but I have the problem that I want these containers to communicate between each other, and for that they would have to know each other's IP addresses, which is the problem of service discovery. And Kubernetes gives a very, very elegant solution to service discovery. You might know other methods like client-side service discovery, like console where every service registers itself with the central service discovery and then another service can fetch the, the addresses. As opposed to that, Kubernetes does service discovery on the network layer. It uh, creates virtual IP addresses on the network to which you can send packets to, and those packets will be load balanced between the instances of a service. So, like in our case, one of the backend containers is sending packets to the processing service. So it addresses that 11.8.2.24 IP address, and the processing service will load balance those packets for all the, between all the processing containers. And add DNS to this, the processing service will actually be registered on the cluster DNS as processing, as the name processing, which any other service can fetch. So you don't even need to know that one IP address. You can actually hard code, I don't know, HTTP dash dash processing into your, into your code even, if you know that you will be running on Kubernetes. So this gives us the this gives us location transparency. We can just send packets to HTTP Kubernetes, and we know they will arrive. And with location transparency, we, of course, get elasticity because we no longer care how many containers are backing the processing service. We can increase that amount, decrease it, unless it goes down to zero. We are very good with, with being elastic and responsive uh, in our application. 
And Kubernetes actually also provides auto-scaling capabilities there based on CPU load and so on. The next uh, problem we need to solve is resilience. But I think you already can see that it's very easy once we have this infrastructure in place. You can, uh, Kubernetes monitors all our containers. Uh, if one burns and crashes, it will just remove it from the load balancer and restart it somewhere else and add it back to the load balancer. And voila, we have resilience. None of this stuff that you've seen has been invented by Kubernetes. This method can be done without Kubernetes. The trick of Kubernetes is to make this super easy. So it becomes not a thing you need to go to the ops department and discuss for three months how to do with all different technologies, but you just get this out of the box and it works. And with this, Kubernetes does, help, does make our applications reactive by making them uh, resilient and elastic. So, but if that's the case, is there still a place for Akka cluster? Yes, is there? So, in order to explore that, we wanted a very relevant case, one that makes Akka cluster very compelling. And actually, we went back to my very first journey into this reactive world. Um, back in 2013, I had this idea for this little startup. The idea was to enable cross-device communication using finger gestures. So like you would do every day on your phone, but then pinching across two screens or swiping across phones. And uh, I actually built that. And uh, these are a few um, like legacy videos that I would like to share with you. So that's the one use case, make a ball appear with the, you know, at the right position with the right screen resolution and things like that. Or another obvious one was transfers picture from one phone to another. So uh, there you go, that was my co-founder back then. You can see that these devices are not exactly new. And, uh, but so yeah, it worked. Um, the next one, very quick, is probably my favorite. Once you establish, yep. yeah. If you establish a connection between two devices, you can just move things seamlessly from one screen to another. And um, now, this was all done via a, via a central, central service. So a central engine that matches phone and takes care of transferring data. So what are the requirements of this service? Well, first of all, we need to allow a fast bidirectional channel between pair devices. So. Uh, once a device is connected, then it needs to be able to send data, but also to receive data, which is why we're, we thought about WebSockets. Um, we need to manage many devices concurrently, because obviously, I had millions of customers. Totally not true, I wish. I had one paying customer that I was really, really proud of, but uh, it really didn't get, wasn't enough to get business going. And um, actually, most reactions I got when I showed these things to people were like, oh, Oh, that's cute. Like, immediately in the friend zone. <laughs> and um, so this, is, uh, this, this company is history now. But anyway, back to our talk. Um, we need to potentially manage many, many devices concurrently. We need to hold state for each connected device. So for instance, um, let's say in the third case, we need to uh, hold state who has the shape, which shape it is, who has the shape at the beginning. Um, and then also, phones connect and disconnect very quickly. So maybe they're connected for a second and then they, they break the connection and things like that. So in this, Akka was a perfect, perfect example. Actors are fantastic for concurrent uh, applications that are very, very concurrent. And so how would you uh, build like that with an actor-based architecture? For example, simplified version, you would have a WebSocket listener. So when a phone connects, this WebSocket listener would send a message to the phone manager saying, hey, a new phone connected. And the phone manager would spawn an actor that would be in charge of everything that that phone has. So maybe its location, its state in general. And this is it. When a new phone connects, same drill, new phone connected, another actor is spawned, and then the phone manager will ask its pre-existing kids do you match with the new phone? In this case, they don't. 
So everything stops here. But when the phone number three connects, and then they do match because they're next to each other, same drill again, a new phone connected, a new actor is spawned, and the phone manager will ask its previous children, do you match with this phone based on this location? And it appears that phone one matches phone three. Then phone one can directly address phone three with a message because phone one knows its address. And at that point, they can ex start exchanging messages to each other directly without going through a central entity or something. So at this point, the logical path of information becomes something like this. Um, through a web socket, each phone is represented by an actor. And then messages are ex exchanged between these two actors, and information is sent back to the paired phone. Right, everything works, everything's very nice, but as we mentioned earlier, we're going to have millions of connected phones at the same time, right? And so at some point, we would have a scalability issue. We cannot fit as many, you know, all these phones on one single JVM. So how do we solve that? Well, if we go and exploit this concept of location transparency, we can then split our application in two. One node will hold the listener, and other nodes will hold phone managers and their children. So that when I need a new node, I will just pin a new one up that contains more, more phones. And now, how does it work when a new phone connects uh, that enters the picture? Well, the listener will send a message to the phone manager that has the least number of kids. And this phone manager will create a new actor. And then there's a, some more messaging being exchanged. But at the end, we find that phone let's say phone six and phone nine are found to be matching, and they can ex start the same exchange of messages like if it was on the same JVM. So even across different nodes, that, that all happens transparently to you. Well, Aka, you know, underneath, someone needs to know where this other JVM is, but we'll, we'll get there. But to you, that's completely transparent. So if we were to sketch this as a bit of an architecture, you would have the phones connect to a gateway server service instance, and then you have all these multiple phone instances, and inside them, these actors are able to talk to each other. So really, the, the most important thing of this slide is that arrow right there. It's a, inter, it, it's a communication be directly between services. It's a stateful microservices architecture. And, well, maybe the Kubernetes world has something to say about this. Yeah, so I'll show a slide uh, that shows how you could do the same without ACA cluster. But before that, I would mention that for me, this was probably the, uh, in our collaboration with Fabio, this was the, the biggest learning for me that Kubernetes doesn't really help you build stateful services. So whenever you need state, this application level framework that lets, allows that kind of communication, this very natural programming model, uh, where you can actually write in your code that I'm talking to that other phone and those messages will be taken care of is a very powerful feature. Um, how I would have done this without such a toolkit as like a cluster is push the, the, the data problem into a distributed database. So this is a stateless microservice architecture where the state is in the database it has the advantage that all my phone, so the, the phone, you can also see that there is a WebSocket listener here, there is a number of phone service instances, all of these don't hold any state, they just hold the business logic, and the actual data about phone one and phone three and phone X is all stored in a database that hopefully can be scaled and can hold all the data we will ever need and can be uh, queried fast enough. Um, in this case, the, the good part of this architecture is that if I want to replace the business logic that is in the phone service, I can do that without having to deal with persisting and retrieving uh, the data because my database version will change less often. But you can also see that the, the programming model will become inserts and queries instead of writing this nice Java code where I'm, I can just send messages to another phone. Here I have to first 
uh, write the fact that phone one is connected to phone three into the database as a record, and then when a query or another message needs to be sent out to a phone, then I need to query the database. So every all the all the distribution data distribution complexity is pushed down to the database, which in some cases might be perfect, in some other cases might not be that great. But uh, but what we get with this kind of architecture is full support from Kubernetes to implement this. Here I boxed these uh, objects into the Kubernetes terminology to just show how Kubernetes helps us to implement this. Kubernetes doesn't give us a distributed database, so that's the first thing we need to pick one, but Kubernetes with the help of something called a stateful set helps us to deploy uh, databases to, to Kubernetes, and there are now even more advanced ways to, to run databases on Kubernetes. You don't necessarily have to do that, like if a cloud provider just give you, gives you databases as a service, just go for it, but you can do databases on top of Kubernetes. The most interesting, I'll get back to stateful sets, even though I don't have time to really explain them. Uh, let's just go to the deployment in the middle. The, uh, phone service instances will be managed by Kubernetes using something called a deployment object, where you practically tell Kubernetes, I want to run this type of container with this configuration this many times. Kubernetes, please do your magic and take care of that. And Kubernetes will keep, will make sure to keep that many containers of that type running all the time. If they die, it rest if they die, they re it restarts them. It might auto scale them, etc and it will do a nice rolling upgrade of your containers if you want to upgrade to a newer version of your code or want to downgrade them because you introduced a new bug. And the extra component that is needed, if you remember the part about uh, elasticity and location transparency, there is the service object in front of the deployment, so the deployment just runs the containers, and the service object is the thingy that you need to instantiate on Kubernetes to make sure that there is an addressable endpoint behind which all the phone service instances are running. And then they get load balanced. And the, a stateful set is something similar to a deployment, except that the, each container has a unique ID which can be addressed because in a stateful application you can't just treat you just can't just load balance and treat every container as equal. Probably in a, in a distributed database, you'll probably have a master node to which you're supposed to talk to, and then there is replication going on and so on. And there is the WebSocket listener in the, in the front, with which you might have noticed we're not really dealing with that because it would be just the same story all over again. And then the last piece is the ingress controller, which is routing traffic into the cluster. So these are the building blocks you can use in Kubernetes. There are, there are a few more, of course, but this slide is supposed to show you that Kubernetes does give you tools to implement this type of architecture. That's why, that's why we kind of link the stateless microservices to Kubernetes. So is Akka cluster suitable for a microservice architecture? Let's take a look at that. It's a quite different view on things, so a bit of a now for something completely different, uh, Monty Python style, but not really completely different. Same thing, different perspective. Uh, we noticed when we started working on this talk that not only is there confusion in between us about how to use these technologies properly, but also we noticed in the reactive community, the thoughts were evolving. First, in a blog post from 2016, a Lightband customer, who is a, who is, which is Lightband is the main company behind Akka. They're also doing consultancy, so they have these success stories. So in a uh, blog post from one of their customers, they were talking about uh, how Akka cluster is an amazing, is their microservice framework basically. They did microservices and they did it with Akka cluster. They got location transparency, resiliency, and everything is running on Akka cluster now, amazing. In 2018, a addition has been added to the Akka cluster documentation saying you should not use Akka cluster as your microservice framework. So why the confusion? Basically at the heart of the problem is 
are actors, really microservices. And in a lot of ways, they really look like it, especially if you're already writing your code encapsulated in actors, you have Akka cluster, you practically get this picture where you have location transparency from actors running on Akka cluster and also from microservices running on Kubernetes. Same goes for resiliency and same goes for scalability. They do these things in very different ways, but from a high level perspective, they do give you these traits. Well, but in the end, what actors don't give you is independent deployment as opposed to microservices because actors are in the end Java classes and there is no good mechanism in the world of Java to deploy Java classes to a running JVM and that's all right. Actors never really tried to be this. It's, we're not trying to say that actors are not good because of this. It's just a that in the end, uh, they do bring certain problems if you want to use Akka Cluster as your microservice platform. Let's take a look at different ways you can, you can deploy actors and see uh, how, how you can do it. First of all, the one code base, one cluster approach. You have all your actors in a monolithic code base and then you might run multiple instances of that monolithic code base and then you can see the web service gateway or the phone actor, these are the actors. Then the phone service instances would be containers or pods in Kubernetes terminology on top of Kubernetes or running in some different way in a JVM. And, all of, and then you run many instances and these join an ACA cluster and that way you can have different phones represented or running on different instances of the application so it's actually scalable. Your problem comes when you realize you want to make changes to the phone actors much faster than to the WebSocket gateway or the other way around, you will need to always deploy everything together. So the next step would be, and this is what the iHeart guys from the blog post I mentioned did, you can actually have several different code bases, let's say encapsulated in Docker containers, and deploy them into, let's say in Kubernetes, and let, let them form a single Akka cluster. In this case, you will be able to actually kind of have best of both worlds because you are able to deploy uh, different code bases independently. So let's say you can have a different team working on the WebSocket gateway and another team working on the phone service, and you can deploy their work independently and they can still use actor messaging to communicate. So really the programming model doesn't change, but you're, you're stretching uh, ACA cluster based programming to the limit basically. The downside here is that actor messaging is still Java serialization in the end. So you are bound to a certain version of a Java class which is quite brittle. You are completely bound with all your services to the full JVM stack, and not just till JVM and Java or Scala, but all the way up to using actors. So WebSocket Gateway would probably be a good candidate that you might just grab a third party, whatever technology to, to implement it instead of doing it by your own actors, but in this model, you can't do it. So the true microservice architecture where everything is really lightly coupled, loosely coupled, is where you would have, but you still, let's say, want to use Akka cluster because you like it and you implemented also your WebSocket gateway using actors and it works great, but you still want this independent evolution and maybe in the future have the option to replace it, then you really create different Akka clusters for your different services. So inside the cluster, you will still use actor messaging, so the main benefit we gained from actors which was that the phone actors can talk to each other over the network, you get all that, and, but in between different types of services, you will go to uh, the usual HTTP event queue, whatever uh, technology independent stack uh, protocol stack you want to use, and yeah, there you get into all the, the, the usual microservice architecture design problems. So, but this is, this is really a stateful microservice architecture here. So your sta services are stateful, but you can scale them and they can communicate just as any other microservice communicates. 
So this is this was so in the end, we would say that Akka cluster can be used for a microservice architecture. Uh, I think all the three architectures are very valid patterns to use. There is no real uh, winner here or or something or an anti-pattern in there. It's just that you should consider the trade-offs, basically going from monolith to a half microservice solution to a full microservice solution and use any pattern in the right context. So finally, can Akka cluster and Kubernetes work together? Are they friends or foes? So the answer is yes, of course, because Kubernetes can run your can run an Akka cluster, can act as the infrastructure layer for Akka cluster. So in that sense, there is no real conflict. There is no uh, reason why you would not use them together. But actually, the interesting thing is that Kubernetes is an excellent platform for Akka cluster. So first of all, uh, it helps you form the cluster. This is a picture from Wikipedia or somewhere, no, not from, from cosmologica.com formation of the solar system. And just like uh, planets form around the sun, so can an ACA cluster form around the Kubernetes API server. Was that a stretch? <laughs> so at the heart of Kubernetes is the, the API server, which co hosts the, the controllers that make the cluster tick. All the information about everything running on the cluster is there. It's pollable. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's there, you can make queries against it, can get information out, you can, get, you can use everything Kubernetes knows about what's running. So if I would want to create an Akka cluster on top of Kubernetes, the biggest problem with forming an Akka cluster is the nodes finding each other. In a uh, classical uh, infrastructure with, where there is a networking team and virtual machines all over the place, or physical machines, a data center may be connected, maybe not. Uh, this can be a quite hard problem. You cannot just register DNS names or known IP addresses and whatever. Uh, and then if it's rigid, then you really don't get all the elasticity and everything. But on Kubernetes, this you start up a few ACA cluster containers, and what you can do is let them each query the Kubernetes API server and get the information about what other containers are there on the cluster. So these three containers will all talk to the API server and make a query, tell me, are there any other containers that would have the label cluster with the value my cluster? On Kubernetes, I can add these kind of uh, arbitrary labels to any containers I'm running. And then I can make queries to the API server. And I can do this, for example, from Java code. There is a SDK, and I can go and, uh, and make queries against the Kubernetes API server. And the Kubernetes API server will tell me, yeah, there are three uh, containers like that. And then these containers will talk to each other. And using the Akka cluster protocol, figure out how to form a cluster. And when another container would like to, we would like to add another node to the cluster later, we will just instantiate it, and the others can keep pulling the, the API server, and they will find it, and it will also find the other nodes and join in the cluster. So using Kubernetes tooling, this becomes nearly trivial. So a new addition to the, uh, to the Akka universe is uh, Akka Bootstrap that actually implements this algorithm. But we have done a similar thing with Fabio before we knew that this thing exists and we have implemented it pretty quickly. So it's, with Kubernetes, this becomes very, very easy. And what you get at the end is a stack like this. You have virtual machines on the bottom that are Kubernetes nodes that host pods, which are, are containers that host uh, vir uh, JVMs that are hosting our actor code and are forming an ACA cluster. So we will have a cluster on top of a cluster, and that's the heart of also where our confusion about all this was coming from. And yeah, and that all works actually. So handing over to Fabio, let's show some other ways 
Aqua cluster and Kubernetes can work together. Yeah, so going back to the initial principle that we mentioned, so resilience in this case, uh, let's just recap it. What happens inside your own JVM when you're running an, an actor-based system is that actors die. Remember our Terminator friends from earlier? Well, the supervisor detects that and takes the necessary measure. So in this case, it starts it and everything starts working again. In the Kubernetes world, you would have pods and then pods sometimes die. The deployment controller, in this case it's a replica set, it will realize that the pod is gone, magic will happen, pod will be restarted. Now, if you see any similarities, don't worry, you're not alone. The thing is that they, these two processes happen at a very different level. So within your own pod, and then at really at a, at a node level. And this is a fantastic way where Akka, Akka cluster, but Akka in general, and Kubernetes complement each other. So much that we can try and draw a bit of a scale of resilience, where we divided this, this scale in a few different sections, where on the left we have the you know, local JVM exceptions, and then up to JVM errors, like out of memory error, for instance, or hardware failure, and then the most tragic cases on the far right. And then we'll see that ACA is really helpful on that level, on that locality of JVM exceptions. Kubernetes, on the other hand, which doesn't know at all what's happening inside your, your services, is really good at JVM errors and, you know, partially some hardware failure, depends on uh, probably your cloud provider. Um, and so that's another way where they, the two complement each other very well. Because, for instance, restarting an actor is infinitely faster than restarting a pod. Maybe for a pod restart, we're talking about seconds, for instance, where, whereas an actor is, is really practically instantaneous. And, uh, well, so at this point, what about what, what, what do we do when Skynet attack, attacks? Well, um, I suppose your uh, cloud provider should uh, be <laughs> ready to face that. I, I don't know, maybe there's some uh, Google or Amazon people here we can, uh, we can ask. But um, yeah, so that's a way that they complement each other in the resilience world. How about the location transparency that also we mentioned at the beginning? Well, Kubernetes, runs everything on vir virtual machines in the end under the hood. And the thing is you don't, you don't need to know the IP addresses of these virtual machines. They're managed for you. Um, as Adam was showing before, you can just, get, just be fine, work with, uh, with pod labels, for instance. Well, at that point, Kubernetes has this location transparency at really a lower level. And then these virtual machines will run pods. And then within pods, you will have your actors that will communicate with each other. And ACA, the system below actors, doesn't need to know the IP address because of Kubernetes. So again, really cool collaboration between the two. Um, to recap what we've gone through, uh, we've done a little introduction of these concepts to be all on the same page. And then we try to answer a few questions. Can Kubernetes make an application reactive? Yes. It will take your application, introduce elasticity, resilience on top of it. What value does Akka Cluster provide on top of Kubernetes at this point? Well, Akka Cluster is great for stateful services, and it provides you know, more granular control and set of features that you can uh, embed directly into your business, log business logic. Is Akka Cluster suitable for a microservice architecture? Mm, not really. It, or yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> But it, it depends. We still have some disagreements. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think it's very important what Adam mentioned earlier, that in the end, actor messages is all about JVM classes. And that's something that is you know, more trickier to evolve. Um, and finally, how can Akka Cluster and Kubernetes work together? Well, we've just seen that they are fantastic at collaborating. So, so much that we believe that Akka and Kubernetes together actually give you superpowers despite the verses in the title. Um, I would go as far as saying that Kubernetes should be the recommended way to deploy your clustered ACA applications. And 
This is a, uh, these are a few references that we uh, used in our research and loved, very inspiring. Um, well, the first two books are uh, O'Reilly books, but I can tell that's a coincidence. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they, this is really inspiring stuff if you want to go further. And um, this is all we have. So thank you for your attention. Do we have some moments for questions? 28 seconds. <laughs> Room for questions. Oh, I saw a couple. So the example that, you, that we were discussing in, in this presentation, um, don't you think it's a good candidate for peer-to-peer -peer communication rather than going for a ECA backend? The, the phones? Yeah. yeah. Sure. But so we, we, with actor messaging, we can have a bit of a peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean having two phones directly communicating yeah, with yeah, each yeah, other yeah, instead yeah. of the backend? Yeah, we could, we could rethink the whole system in that, in that sense. Um, it's 2018, so probably I would rebuild it on the blockchain, because why not? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there are, there are many, there's many uh, I, I wouldn't. But yeah, we, we could have some peer-to-peer -peer communication for sure. Um, we're using both at our company and uh, yeah. are trying to merge them. Um, our problem is rather of political nature. We're not, we can't use stateful sets for some reason. Yes, feel free to comment. And um, so we're trying to use a, a standard deployment and uh, use a cluster with uh, Bootstrap on it. And the difficulties we have is the um, or sort of the election of who is where, so they uh, so the, the seed uh, nodes they can communicate w with each other. Do you have any well not ready-made solutions for that, but hints from where we can go there? Oh. I'm sorry, but I don't really from from like this short description. We've we just tried Bootstrap because we're also building a small example application for this talk, but did not really dive into like that deep that we would already encounter like production problems. Or we, we actually did, but those were like really big problems that they'll solve pretty sh shortly because they were just like, well, it's just new and some things were not properly implemented. Like it yeah. couldn't run in another namespace than default. That, that kind of weird stuff. I, I think things are evolving in this space. So maybe Lightband or someone else will, will solve this soon. Yeah, but maybe we can uh, have a chat afterwards yeah. to, to really hear like what are the what kind of problems because yeah like but this is actually an interesting thing like the cluster on top of a cluster. So these problems stem from that, that basically you have leader election, you can have your Kubernetes cluster have problems around the uh, network uh, se separation, whatever. And then you have an Aqua cluster on top of that, which again will have the same problems. And it's again doing the same kind of algorithms to solve that, but a bit different and on different levels. And, uh, and the interaction of that can be quite complex. So in that sense, maybe it's a good argument to really only use like a cluster when you really need it, so you don't have like a double cluster situation. Hi, just wondering, is this perhaps adding to the complexity in some way? Um, because if you think about it, you're underlying EC2 instances, say in the case of Amazon, could die, your Kubernetes pod can die, and then your actors can die on top of that. So you get into all sorts of complex scenarios of where, what gets routed onto what system then, and, and um, two, two masters, and, and all this type of thing. Any experience, I guess, of that happening, and, how to, and, and what happens there? Um, well, one interesting thing the, in, in this case is, for instance, your uh, maybe your uh, your actors, so your business logic dies, but the pod is still alive, or or any combinations of of, of those things. And um, what I think it would be cool is to have uh, a monitoring situation solution over all the stack that you mentioned. Um, oh, as far as you get, um, how does, uh, for instance, Google handle the VM dying? And is there a, 
they don't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so Are you mean like in the Kubernetes? Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah, think so they... Yeah, so like uh, Kubernetes also like if the master, if like you have a master election problem because let's say your master part of your master cluster has died, then yeah, those are not problems you can just give like easy recommendations. But probably like Lightband now is refocusing efforts on using Kubernetes as the standard platform and they're doing this bootstrap thing. So I would imagine them implementing uh, Kubernetes specific features into Akka cluster where you can better handle this. If you assume Kubernetes is running under you and you can talk to the API server, then maybe you can do smarter things than just detect that one of your Akka cluster nodes disappeared. Maybe you can hear about that from Kubernetes and maybe you can tell Kubernetes to restart it and so on and then you reduce the surface of these problems that you can get with leader election and so on. But yeah, there are no uh, silver bullets for this it's a combination. No. Yep. Wait, wait for the mic, please. Hi. Uh, so, in this world of uh, microservices, what would you what would you say is the main um, benefit of using the actor-based application model? Because it's quite a different application model from the typical microservice, which is uh, also yeah. a very small um, uh, code base, right? So, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, to me personally, I might be a little biased, but I, I love the programming model. It's just, uh, makes a nicer experience to me. It leads to, you know, all the concepts that we have seen about microservices, and they're great, you know, independent and, uh, and separated modular, that brings it really back inside your application. So I, I like that approach. Uh, plus, it lets you use stateful services, like what we have seen with the messaging between actors. That becomes really trivial uh, without going through a middle infrastructure. Um, so I think actor model has a lot of benefits. Um, maybe we can expand later. Yeah, like make. you get uh, this, this nice asynchronous communication without having to run a message bus, for example. So Akka cluster takes care of your application level message routing, but it does it with just forming nodes from your basically worker nodes. You don't have to have extra infrastructure. You, your application is naturally supporting a distributed programming model. So it does, uh, yeah, I think it's, I, in the end, I asked the exact same question when we started off with Fabio and I got to see the light in the end in, the, in there that building these kind of services is, is a, uh, just the micro, if you just look at things that things are microservices and they run on Kubernetes, you are missing a lot of support for actually building microservices. Like uh, Kubernetes doesn't help you handle events or do, do really handle your application payloads. In the end, it stays on more on the infrastructure level also, look at Istio while well, we're there. That, that gives you a few more services that you would maybe put into your application logic. So the, the trend is there to remove as much from your microservices as possible and move them into a outside service. But still, it's not everything. And yeah. It looks like we're done. So thank you yeah, guys thank again. Thank you, everyone.